Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Channel 781 News special report. A few weeks ago, I heard that a friend of a friend named Mike Sutherland had passed away. And I knew that he was uh, someone who was experiencing homelessness. So I reached out to my friend Chris Gamble to see if he knew Mike. And it turns out he did know Mike. It also turned out that there were two other people in Waltham who passed away, also passed away within a, a week of Mike. For those who don't know, we have shelters here in Waltham. There's a men's shelter and a women's shelter. We also have a community day center, and we have an organization called Chaplains on the Way um, that serves the community of unhoused people in a lot of different ways. And when someone from that community passes away, most of us don't hear about it usually, or if we do hear about it, we don't really have any context for what role that person played in our community. Um, so I reached out to Chris, and we've been talking about how to report on this. And uh, Chris, can you give us a little more background? Yes, thank you, Josh. Um, thank you for wanting to do this story, uh, first of all. Um, I'm really happy with how this turned out. Uh, but uh, you'll remember that when you first came to me with, this, uh, with the idea of a story about Mike's death, um, I initially didn't want to do it because despite... Uh, most of my activism um, in Waltham centering people experiencing homelessness, I tend to not lean on it when doing this kind of like news segment -y kind of stuff, because the last thing I want to do is seem exploitative. The last thing I want to do is take advantage of anyone. Um, and so I generally, it ends up these stories not getting told from my, my perspective either. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realize that, you know, these are stories that should be told, um, you know, with uh, Mike's uh, death, you know, he was found on the side of the road um, in Waltham. Uh, it's just, that's a real person just dying on the side of the road and the world keeps turning. The world just forgets that that happened. And if it's not someone like you and me talking about this, uh, then it's probably not gonna get covered. And so I think these are stories that should be told. Um, these are real people. These are my friends. And um, so I'm glad we ended up with something that I think is not exploitative and does tell the story. So the other two um, people who passed away were named Barry and Peachy. Did you know them as well? Yes, yes, I, um, I knew Barry very well. I unfortunately did not know Peachy, though I hear great stories about him now. And can you tell us a little bit about the people you interviewed for this report? So yeah, so in the in trying to keep it as unexploitative as possible, I went with two um, advocates of the unhoused community. There's Carolyn, um, who is the executive director of the Day Center, who you'll see first. And then there's Jill, the executive director of Chaplains on the Way, both organizations that work very closely with the unhoused uh, population of Waltham. And then I also have a resident of the Bristol Lodge Women's Shelter because, um, while Barry tragically passed away, there's an additional uh, component there that uh, his partner, um, who they've been together for 20 years, um, is still you know on the street of Waltham. And so I wanted to get the perspective of what it's like to lose a partner. I didn't want to use Barry's partner for this, but so I asked her friend, um, who we who you'll see in this video. Um, talking about that perspective. So that to me felt okay to do. I'm glad you decided to do this, Chris. I really appreciate it. I know this is uh, also really personal for you. Do you have any other thoughts you want to share before we go ahead and watch it? So like I said, I'm very, very pleased with how this turned out. I think I think it's a great um, segment piece. Uh, I, I would personally, um, it was very cathartic for me. I, I went into this project coming at it from a very professional angle, wanting to just get content to uh, release. And what happened was, you know, it helped me deal with the deaths of my friends. Um, and so I'm very appreciative of that. And I'm also just very appreciative of working within this community um, during Barry's memorial, which is also talked about here. Um, you know, I, I had this weird sense of like deep gratitude for working within this community. Um, there's so much love, there's so much camaraderie um, and just a lot of fun as well. Um, and so, you know, I invite anyone that does things in Waltham, anyone that does any good work, there is things, there is ways to get involved within this community. And I promise you will not regret that. And um, it changes people's lives. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I'm really excited to share this. So let's go ahead and watch it. This wasn't the first time that this happened. Um, when I started 
I've been here for over six years at this point. Early in my career here, um, there was a month in August where someone died every single day in a one week period. Mm -hmm. And it, it was mind blowing. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's the same feeling that I feel if I were to hear a family member had died. That is how close we knit this community is. But there's something different when, when someone dies of an overdose and, and it's someone who has been living on the streets. Things, I get this weird feeling, this energetic feeling of this being a sacred moment. I don't know how to explain the feeling any other way other than it being a sacred moment. That this human being struggled so desperately in life and now is finally out of that struggle that it feels like a relief that they're out of the struggle but this incredible sadness mm -hmm. that this life experience was so difficult for them. Absolutely. That is what I feel. It was like sitting right here in this chair mm -hmm. um, as I found out about the two deaths that uh, of folks um, found out about a third death later. And I think with any other um, death in a community of people that you love, your first reaction is a sort of shock, even though the folks in this community are at great risk you know, all the time from all the mental health challenges or substance use a disorder or any of the other things, he lots of health challenges, cancer, heart attacks, just stress-related diseases and um, the kinds of challenges we all face, it's still a shock when anyone in particular does. Mm -hmm. You just can't believe it, that person is suddenly gone. So there's shock and then, you know, time stops and um, your heart drops past the floor and, um, even though I'm here in a professional context, I mean, I cry right mm -hmm. away. But when I mm -hmm. found out um, about one of the recent deaths, I was crying so fast I didn't realize I was crying until I just had tears all over my face. Mm -hmm. And the people in the community who had come to tell me about the death, you know, we went together to another room just to spend some time together crying. Of course. The first thing that happens is people pull together. Mm -hmm. People care. Yeah. People know each other. I, um, I was saying that it's a misconception that people experience homelessness as individuals. Just, you know, lo it is lonely, it can be lonely to be homeless, but um, there's absolutely a community of people who know each other and care about each other. And when something like this happens, you see people finding ways to support each other through tragedy. And so um, people gather, people were gathered at McDonald's uh, that Friday mm -hmm. afternoon when we all found out about Barry's death. And, you know, what can you do in the face of anyone's grief? Barry's partner was just beyond um, grief beyond grief. And the only thing that you can do for people is to be there for them, to be witness to that grief, to help hold the space for them to go through it, knowing that they're not alone. So people were gathered at McDonald's um, you know, we can buy each other French fries, uh, mm. give each other a cigarette, listen to the person say over and over again, I can't believe it, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. Barry, we knew because he was a regular here and he'd come in with his uh, partner and they'd sit in the two comfy chairs that we have right in front of the TV and always polite, always asking what they could do to help. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, a huge loss. Barry and his partner, I think, are, are one example of, of the gaps in our system that all of us collectively are, are responsible for fixing. Uh, because there's no room in the system, there's no expectation of people being partnered in homelessness. And so there are, there's no shelter for mm -hmm. folks who, you know, unless maybe family shelters, but even those are anticipating a woman and her children. There's no room for love in the system, yeah. it, it, which is a way of dehumanizing people. And, um, and you see it not only in the fact that Barry and his partner, could, you know, if they wanted to be together, they had to be sleeping rough, sleeping out, mm -hmm. because there's no shelter for partners. Um, and if, for instance, a couple wants to go into recovery together, 
no space for that either. The assumption is that people's partners can only be a deficit, they can only be a barrier to recovery. And I don't think we treat people like that who aren't experiencing homelessness. We have respect for the value of their relationships. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's part of the tragedy of Barry's death is thinking, you know, one of the many ways that he was stressed by homelessness was the fact that he had a partner whom he loved for more than 20 years and they were going through this together and it was extra, you know, of course it was, they were helped by the fact that they were in relationship with each other, but they were also hurt by it. Barry's partner was also the victim of an overdose. She thankfully survived. Um, when she got back to the shelter, you, I'm sure everyone already knew about the circumstance because it, she stayed in the hospital for a couple days, right? No, she got out that morning. Was it that morning? So she woke, she has no memory of what happened that mm -hmm. night. No memory, no memory of a lot of it, of what, you know, even the drug use that led to it. Mm. Um, so her first memory was waking up in the morning in the hospital. And not only is the, the nurses there, but the police are there. Mm. And so she's asking, where's Barry? Where's Barry? And it was, you know, he didn't make it. You guys both OD'd. We were able to save you, but he didn't make it. Um, so yeah, and then she's being questioned by the police at the same time, was taken down to the police station. So they questioned her and she's just reeling from it this entire time. Um, so they dropped her off at McDonald's, which is where we were. So she came with a sweater on and then the, the hospital gown underneath. Um, and she was, I mean, that's when, that was the moment we found out. We were all sitting inside mm -hmm. McDonald's and one of our other friends came in and put some of her stuff down and some of his stuff because she had it too and he yeah. threw it down on the table and he just said he's dead he's dead and we were like wait what's happening right now who's and he's like right. barry barry's dead and he walks right out of, and we're all just sitting there going it was like a bad dream just mm -hmm. it we couldn't we couldn't even accept it and i knew that she probably couldn't either so we all walked outside and she was absolutely just beside herself yes. Um, that was really, really rough. And so how about the rest of the first day? Like that whole first day, yeah. she doesn't even really remember yeah, sure. much of what happened. Um, so we always, we had to keep coming back and kind of reminding her of what happened. But, um, even now she's still beside herself in a lot of ways and mm -hmm. forgets things and doesn't really, you know, I'm like, Hey, uh, you know, what, what's the date today? She goes, I don't, why are yeah. you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> How has the community of uh, people experiencing homelessness in Waltham um, come together to support uh, Barry's partner? That was the beautiful part mm -hmm. about it, was that, you know, she really learned that day who her real friends were, all mm -hmm. the people that came over, all the people from Chaplains on the Way that just left what they were doing and showed up where she was. Mm -hmm. um, and we stayed by her side for the first three days straight. Mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. um and gradually she kind of got out to do other things on her own but it was it's nice when everybody comes together in such a supportive way but it's so horrible that it takes things like this mm -hmm. and she does know that she has good friends out here and what i've experienced being unhoused is that other unhoused homeless people have done more for me and given me more mm. than anyone else. Mm. Um, it's, you, you become grateful for things that you took for granted before. So in that sense, I'm grateful for all of that. But mm. if it takes hell to go through to get there, it's, yeah. that's a tough road. Absolutely. The last time that I saw Barry, the last conversation we had, we were standing about five feet from where I am right now in this space we rent at First Parish. And he had a package of three buffs. And the reason why he had that was because he had talked to one of the other chaplains and told him that his ears were hurting from the mask. I don't know if it's part of being bald, but mm. I haven't had that problem. Or maybe I have a small head, but Barry was a big guy. And he, he explained to the chaplain that his ears were really hurting from the mask. And uh, Chaplain Bill said, I know what you can do. I'll, I'll get you some buffs, or a buff anyway. And so Bill had given it to me, and I had given it to Barry, and there were three in the package, and they were all the same pattern. 
And it was just one of those sort of silly, joyous moments because Barry put it on and he was just really happy about his ears not needing to hurt anymore. And he gave one to his partner and she put it on and they were matching. So they looked really cute mm -hmm. together. You know, it was like the two of them dressed to match. But they had this one extra one and another community member came over and was admiring uh, these buffs. And Barry just spontaneously said, oh, we have an extra one. Would you like to have one? Mm -hmm. And he gave it to the other community member. And then there were all three of them standing there looking like oh. <laughs> triplets in, yeah. these, in this buff. Um, and that was, you know, the last thing that I ever saw Barry do oh, was okay. to be generous to another community member, be caring to somebody else in the community. Really like, can you put into words, like, what it's like or even your sense of what it's like to lose a partner when you already like are dealing with, you know, homelessness, when you have that kind of support system and then all of a sudden it's gone. That I, I remember the first few days sitting there with her and just looking at the look on her face mm -hmm. and you know, the tears coming out of her. I could only imagine, I mean, I sat there and really tried to imagine it because they were together for 22 years. Yeah, I mean, and for many of those years, they were homeless together. Mm -hmm. They were glued, you know, by the hip mm -hmm. to each other. And yeah, they were absolute, you know, they were each other's rock. It's already so yeah. hard to be homeless. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. And I would have... I would have never understood, even listening to other people's stories and listening to their troubles and their obstacles and what they're going through, I would have never been able to understand it had I not experienced it myself. So I'm mm -hmm. actually really glad for that. Mm -hmm. um, but everything is difficult. Everything is mm -hmm. so difficult. And then things pile on, you know, on top of each other. To lose like the love of your life in that moment and still have to face all that. It's no wonder she still feels lost. Last night we were, we were sitting there watching TV and that was when I asked her what day it was. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't know, you're asking the wrong person. And then I looked down on my phone and she said, all I know is it's another day without Barry. Oof. Oof. And yeah, so we all started crying at that moment. Mm -hmm. Any, are there any stories you would like to share about the um, recently deceased? Um, I didn't know Peachy very well and, yeah. and um, he came in a couple of times and was always um, very polite and well-mannered. What I can tell you is, is something that uh, one of his dear friends told me and she said that Peachy treated her with respect on the streets. He wanted to protect her. And I know that women who live on the streets, every single one of them has been exploited and or abused in some way, physically, emotionally. Um, to hear that there was someone in the community who was truly caring and protective, even if it was just of her, of one woman, that's amazing, yeah. and 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 I am I am grateful to him at this point. I really remember a time last summer when I was uh, out of town, but I got a call from Mike Sutherland, who had um, recently gone into recovery, a recovery program, and he was. It was a beautiful Sunday in Boston, and he was out for a walk, and he wanted to call somebody and say how happy and proud that he was and how optimistic he was about his future. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy for him and hopeful for him. And as often happens, yeah, it doesn't, it's, it's not easy to get yeah. into sobriety. It's not easy to be in recovery forever. You have to fall down and get back up and fall down and get back up. But what happened to Mike was um, he landed back into a situation here. He was homeless. He was basically living on the river walk. And I can't tell you how many hours I spent sitting on a bench, you know, on the river walk beside Mike. And what he wanted, in addition to just talking to me, was to get help reaching out to programs. He wanted to get back into a recovery program. And we called and we called and we called and we could not find a placement for him. And that's one of the things that's so heartbreaking is knowing when I say this is preventable, if as a society we could find a way to offer people the help that they're genuinely seeking mm -hmm. with all of their hearts, 
to help themselves find, you know, a safe place and a safe way to live their lives. He could be, he could be alive today. Mm -hmm. And, and he, for those of you who didn't know him, he was a wonderful, funny, I mean, he had his, he had his moments, so don't we all, but, um, he was incredibly smart, incredibly loving, incredibly funny. <laughs> so proud of his Irish heritage. He's a great storyteller and I would give a lot to be able to spend, you know, another hour sitting with him on the river walk. Yeah. He tried so yeah. hard and yeah. it takes so much courage. You know, who, who of us would have that courage to, mm -hmm. to be living on the riverbank, mm -hmm. hungry, cold, tired, mm -hmm. and to nonetheless be focused on how can I believe in myself enough to try again and try again and try again? Mm -hmm. And he did that. And I feel like we as a society failed him that we weren't able to offer him help in, in the moments when he was ready to receive it. I want to I wanna say about Michael that um, I think I had the closest relationship with him of, of so many guests over all these years. And he, I actually hired him. I don't I know if you knew that. But I, no, no, I was here. I remember where he had like two months of sobriety. I remember yes, that. Yes, he yeah. was amazing. And, and Michael was... I love mm -hmm. when he mm -hmm. was sober mm -hmm. and to, I, I, you know, think about who I'm hiring because we work with such a vulnerable community um, and, and Michael, I wanted, I just wanted to give him the chance. I wanted him to see that somebody really trusted him, mm -hmm. someone believed in him I wanted to send that message to him. and. We went for, like you say, just about two months, mm -hmm. and and he did a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. I have to say that his his skills at keeping the place clean, it smelled great, mm -hmm. it looked great, it was, uh, he, and he knew how to cook. Mm -hmm. He made everybody happy with the food. But then one day, one day, it was just one day, mm -hmm. one bad decision, one day, and he was gone. And he, you know, he left us, and yeah. he was back to his old habits, which which is the sadness of addiction. Mm -hmm. um, I always, um, you know, just like you, I, I always had a soft spot for Mike. I, um, I don't know what it was. And and it was during those moments of sobriety. You know, he was he was, you know, in the depths of addiction. But in those mo brief moments of detox or, you know, those brief moments of getting his things together, it just extreme moments of clarity about his life where he just realized that, like, you know, this couldn't go on forever and that he needed to, you know, he was burning bridges and he yes, needed he to get his life put together. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't last. And it, that was just uh, really tough to see. So, you know, I, I will remember Mike in those moments of clarity. That's Me how too. I'm going to remember him. Me too. What this community does, and, and I, I am deeply grateful to chaplains on the way for the way they step right in and they keep the community together when mm -hmm. someone passes. And they do this beautiful service of, of remembrance and acknowledgement mm -hmm. and, and then a celebration of life at, at the end of it. it it's exquisite mm -hmm. and, um, again, uh, unique. I bet this is unique to all them because mm -hmm. I don't think other communities do this. Um, yeah, I often say that that's one of my favorite things at the chapel. And it's does. absolutely and it's, my favorite thing. Absolutely. And it's, and it's you know, coming from like a very local person and can keep everything local. Yeah. I mean, like I said, Hector lived in Waltham for years. These people live in uh, yes. people live in Waltham for years, yeah. and then they they pass away, and then the chaplains didn't put on these memorials. It'd be like nothing ever happened. It'd right. be like you know. You know, this wasn't their home. It, right. it was their home. It's almost that they didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. Um, to have a celebration of life brings us closer to the individual mm -hmm. and takes away that anger. Mm -hmm. If there's a little bit, it assuages the anger just, the anger just a bit, yeah. at least temporarily. And uh, I, I, I think that chaplains play an enormous role here for that, Absolutely. and I'm grateful. Absolutely. Well, it's important for any of us, um, a person in general uh, deserves to be honored, mm -hmm. uh, deserves to be remembered, and it's really important for everybody who knew that person to gather together and remember their life and have a chance to share their grief. And so that's what we do, and certainly that's one of the 
many sad but important tasks that Chaplains on the Way takes on, but we don't do it alone. I mean, the whole community, the, the Waltham Community Leadership Group, which is associated with Chaplains on the Way, more and more takes part in planning memorials uh, to make sure they're responsive to that particular person. It's a network of people. It's a network of caring. Uh, just people come together. Sometimes at the shelter at night, you know, we're supposed to have quiet time after 10 and, and be in bed by 11. And sometimes when it's like 10, 15 and I'm getting really tired and I go, oh, I should go up to my room and call it a night. And I refuse. I take my shoes off and I'm the only one down there and I curl up on the couch and I fall asleep on the couch. And someone has to come down and wake me up at 11 to send me to bed, but it makes me feel normal. Yeah. Like I can fall asleep on the couch in a home. And sometimes it's just that feeling normal, not worrying all the time about everything. Mm -hmm. Cause it, it gets in your head and it's, it's hard to actually start moving forward when all you see around you is the difficulty and the obstacles. And it's, I mean, overwhelming is not even, it doesn't even hit it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's seemingly impossible. Um, okay. Last question. Sure. Um, what can house folks, be doing more or be doing differently to help uh, support the unhoused community? Yeah, for, for me, it's always, the answer is always just an awareness of, of, you know, I live by, you know, the belief that there are, by the grace of God, go I. You know, you know it's just, it could be somebody in my family that's here and wandering the streets. It could be me, it could, why not me? And and I just want um, people to know that, that addiction is a disease. Mm -hmm. And when someone dies of an overdose, it, it should, just shouldn't be that stigma. Um, oh, you know, like, I don't want to know about that, or they did that to themselves. Um, when, when you look at the folks who are using and just can't stop, or aren't ready to stop whatever whatever way you want to look at that. They're struggling. They're suffering. This isn't something, you know, maybe it brings them temporary relief, but it doesn't bring them joy or happiness. In fact, they, they've struggled so much that they've lost all their contacts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just want, when someone hears so-and-so died of an overdose, to be compassionate. Yeah. Is there anything um, housed folks can be doing to support the unhoused community right now, in general, doing better? Well, one of them is to put your compassion hat on <laughs> mm. um, and use your imagination in, in what it might be like to sit down and actually listen to people like you guys are listening to me right now. Um, Donations are always great. I know that when I had, you know, all sorts of things, I did donate quite a bit, but probably not as much as I could have. Mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily money. I just mean coats and shoes and yeah. socks and all those little things. What can people do in Waltham? I would say don't turn away. Mm -hmm. don't, um, don't make the assumption that this doesn't impact you. Uh, in any sort of sense of, of us and them or, or um, any other kind of line drawing because the fact of the matter is that people who live in Waltham who are unhoused are community members of Waltham. They are neighbors. They're housed and unhoused neighbors and we're all here in community together. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, we kind of, I think through uh, the Waltham Community Leadership Group, we kind of grab, uh, crafted a message for a, a meeting years ago now, and I use it all the time. I use it in my campaign about how there are so many people in Waltham that are one illness, one missed paycheck, or a series of uh, un unpredicted losses away from being homeless. And people, yeah. it happens to more people than you would think. Yeah. And it, it could happen to anyone. Yeah, yeah. Any of us could be homeless at any time. And homeless people are people who belong someplace yeah. and need to feel that sense of belonging and need to know that they're in community with others and that we share these problems and the only way to find solutions is to work together. So I, one of the invitations that I would extend is for folks to get to know your unhoused neighbors. Don't, don't turn away from people who are um, you know, sitting on a bench in the commons if you've seen them there before. Maybe introduce yourself, say hello. 
uh, come to a breakfast that Chaplains on the Way holds at First Parish. Come to the Waltham Community Leadership Group. Everybody is welcome, and it's it's a group that centers the voices of people experiencing homelessness, but it very much welcomes everybody who cares, and that it could be any of us. You can come every Tuesday at, at 9.15 and get to know folks and find out what's going on and see all the different ways that you can help. That's awesome. That's just